Dear students, welcome to my video tutorial class. Today I am going to discuss about the liquid state unit, which is unit 8 of chemistry 1 course for BSc first semester major. These are the contents of the liquid state unit, uh, where uh, at first we are going to discuss about the qualitative treatment of the structure of the liquid state. Then we are going to discuss about some important physical properties like vapor pressure, surface tension, coefficient of viscosity, and related. Uh, and then we are going to discuss about some methods used for determination of them. Then we will see some factors which will affect the uh, affect these physical properties. And finally, we will see the effect of addition of various solutes on surface tension and viscosity. At first, I am going to discuss about the qualitative treatment of the structure of liquid state. Among the fundamental states of matter, liquid state is the only state with a definite volume but no fixed shape. A liquid is considered as a nearly incompressible fluid that conforms to the shape of the container but it retains a constant volume independent of pressure. Liquid is made up of tiny vibrating particles of matter such as atoms held together by intermolecular bones. The molecules in a liquid are not as rigidly fixed as in solids. They have some freedom of motion. Uh, the intermolecular forces operating among the liquid molecules are fairly strong and the characteristic properties of the liquids arise from the nature and magnitude of these intermolecular forces. The uh, Qualitative treatment of the structure of liquid is based on whole theory or vacancy theory of liquid. Uh, in 1961, Eiring and Re proposed this simple theory that uh, the intermolecular space in a liquid it is not randomly distributed but it contains some molecular sized holes or vacancies. This is the picture. So, in a liquid, uh, it is considered as random congregation of molecules and these holes are as shown in the following figure. The molecules of the liquid, they continually move into these vacancies and as a consequence, the vacancies also continually move around. This process permits flow of the liquid. So, it is assumed that the molecules surrounding a hole can easily jump into it and are thus considered as gas-like molecules whereas those in immediate contact with the holes are solid-like. Eiring and Re uh, made some simple calculation for measurement of mole fraction of these gas-like or solid-like molecules. So, if we neglect the increase in volume due to holes other than molecular size, the number of holes per molecules is uh, VL minus VS divided by VS. So, whereas VL and VS are the respective molar volumes of the liquid and the solid. So, uh, dear students, Please don't get confused with the liquid and the solid. I am citing that liquid and solid repeatedly. And please uh, don't get confused with these notations because uh, this theory does do not regard the liquid state as a mixer of solid and gas. Uh, a molecule has a solid like properties for a very short time. Uh, however, it instantly transforms to gas like behavior whenever it jumps into neighboring vacancy. So, the sense that a vacancy confers gas-like properties on its neighboring molecules is proportional to the fraction of neighboring positions populated by the molecules. This fraction is Vs divided by Vl if molecules and vacancies are randomly distributed. Thus, for random distribution of vac vacancies, uh, <clears throat> it is equal to Xz, it is equal to Vs divided by Vl multiplied by Vl minus Vs divided by Vs. So, it is it can be equated as Vl minus Vs divided by Vl. Uh, again, Xs, it is equal to Vs divided by Vl. So, Xz and Xs, what are they? They are simply the mole fraction of gas like Xz, Z means gas and Xs, S means solid like. So, they, they both these terms gives the mole fraction of gas like and solid like molecules present respectively. So, based on these ideas, Eiring and Re calculated the melting point, boiling point, critical constant and some other important thermodynamic properties of argon. So, as I have stated earlier, this simple theory does not regard the liquid state as a mixer of solid and 
guess so dear students please don't get confused with the notations like uh, notations gas like and solid like molecules now let's come to a very important term which is free volume in a liquid in a gas what happens under ordinary pressure the molecules move over considerable distances before colliding with one another but in liquid the molecules move over an infinitely small distance before colliding with one another this is because in liquid each molecule is tightly surrounded by almost 10 to 12 neighbors forming a sort of spherical case which can be approximated to a spherical box so uh, dear students please see this picture uh, outside the red circle uh, some black uh, circles are present so these are the these black circles represent the surrounding molecules which are forming a short of spherical case inside the red uh, circle that, that is the boundary of the spherical case one molecule is present at the center so the overall radius of this uh, space where the center molecule where, where the center molecule resides it is considered as rf and the radius of the center molecule it is considered as rm so it is evident that the center of the cage molecule which is present inside the red circle can move about a very small volume this volume for a mole of molecules that is for one mole of liquid molecules it is known as free volume so we can define free volume of a liquid as the average volume per mole of the molecules within which they happen to be free to move about while each one is enclosed in a short of cage of 10 to 12 molecules. We can show that thermodynamically the magnitude of the free volume is 0.37 cm3 per mole. So uh, the free volume per molecule uh, it is equal to 0.61 angstrom cube. If we equate this volume that is 0.61 angstrom cube it equal to uh, to the sphere of radius rf that is rf which is which is representing the average distance traversed by a molecule between successive collisions uh, it is equal to 4 by 3 pi rf cube it is equal to 0.61 angstrom cube so rf it is equal to 0.54 angstrom now let's uh, discuss a very important physical property of liquid which is vapor pressure consider a liquid being placed in a closed vessel with some free space over the liquid what happens a portion of the liquid will vaporize into the free space this process of vaporization will continue until a state of equilibrium is reached between the liquid and the vapor so at equilibrium the rate of condensation of the liquid molecules equals the rate of condensation of the vapor molecules back into the liquid state so thus the vapor pressure of a liquid at a given temperature it is defined as the pressure of the vapor in equilibrium with the liquid at that temperature so Alternately, we can say that a vapor pressure measures the ease with which a liquid molecules can be converted into vapor. So, lower the vapor pressure, higher the volatility of the liquid. So, it is a measure of the volatility of the liquid. The vapor pressure depends only on the temperature and is independent of the quantity of the liquid or the space occupied by the vapor. The vaporization process can also be understood kinetically. The molecules in the liquid state are in continuous motion like the gas molecules, though the mean free path available to them is much smaller. In consequence, the mutual attraction between the molecules is much larger. Within the bulk, the attraction on a molecule is more or less balanced from all direction. But for a liquid molecule present on the surface, there will be much greater attraction uh, inwards than that towards the free space. So, in order to pass into the vapor phase, a surface liquid molecule must possess sufficient energy to break this force of attraction. If E denotes uh, the excess energy per gram mole to be possessed in order to overcome this force of attraction and vaporize, then the number of molecules NL where nl is the number of molecules per cc of the liquid having energy more than e is given by nl is equal to nl into e to the power uh, minus e by rt again if ng denotes the number of molecules per cc of the vapor 
the rate of condensation of the vapor molecule will be given by lambda dash n to n z, where lambda dash is a constant. At equilibrium, the rate of condensation and the evaporation process would be equal. Then we can write lambda dash n z. It is equal to n l into e to the power minus e by r t. Assuming ideal behavior for the gas, that is the vaporized molecules, we can write the vapor pressure P as P is equal to C into RT. C uh, into RT where C is NG divided by N, NA. NA means Avogadro's number, where NG is the number of molecules present per cc of the gas. So, NC it is equal to NA by RT into P or P it is equal to NC into RT divided by NA. We can also write P as uh, NL divided by lambda dash into R divided by NA into T into E to the power minus E by RT. So it is equal to lambda into T into E to the power minus E divided by RT. So where uh, P is the vapor pressure in this expression, P is the vapor pressure, lambda it is the constant, T is the temperature, E uh, uh, small e being the exponent, E is the excess energy to be possessed by the molecule to pass into the vapor phase, R it is the gas constant, T is again the temperature. So <coughs> NL, it is practically independent of temperature. Let us discuss about the methods employed for determination of vapor pressure. The methods employed for determination of vapor pressure can be categorized into two types. First one is static method, second one is dynamic method. For the static method, as the name suggests, uh, the liquid is allowed to establish equilibria with its vapor without being disturbed. While in the second, that is the dynamic method, a liquid is disturbed by boiling it or passing a stream of inert gas through it during the determination of vapor pressure. So first, uh, we will discuss about the static method. Under the static method, the first uh, method that comes under is barometric method. So this is the picture uh, for barometric method for measuring of vapor pressure. So, in this method, two barometric tubes are used. These are filled with mercury. This black, black, uh, these black portions are mercury. So, the, the barometric tubes are filled with mercury and then inverted into some trough, uh, into the same trough of mercury. So, in a trough, mercury is containing and the tubes filled with mercury, they are inverted into the trough. So, one tube is used for comparison with the other. It's what? we do a small amount of the given liquid is introduced into one of the tubes with the help of a teeth pipette. See the picture. It is the teeth pipette used to introduce the liquid into one of the tubes. Until the space above the mercury, it is saturated as shown by small quantity of the liquid remaining on the surface of mercury. Now, the difference in the levels of the mercury in the two tube give the value of the vapor pressure of the liquid at a given temperature. We can carry out this whole procedure for a series of temperature by enclosing the two tubes in a jacket maintain a different temperature by circulating a suitable liquid. The second method under the Static method is isotenoscopic method. This is the picture uh, where isotenoscope, uh, isotenoscopic method is being illustrated. It was devised by A. Smith and A. W. C. Menzies. The main part of the apparatus is a isotenoscope which comprises of a bulb A. In the figure, this is the bulb A and a u-shaped portion of the tube b this is the u-shaped portion okay so the now what is done the bulb is now nearly half filled with the given liquid that is the liquid for whose vapor pressure has to be measured and the u-shaped portion of the tube b uh, is filled to a level of about 2 to 3 centimeter below that in the bulb with the same liquid the isotenoscope a b is then surrounded by a water bath maintained at a constant temperature t in the next step the u tube is then connected to a manometer c a manometer uh, is an instrument used to 
measure atmospheric pressure and then to a large bottle D this is the large bottle D to smooth out any pressure fluctuation present in the system the bottle can be alternately also connected to a suction pump or to air to do the same the uh, overall isotenoscopic method uh, used for determination of vapor pressure involves the following step in the first step the bottle d this bottle d it is connected to a vacuum pump and the apparatus is evacuated with the help of this pump until the uh, liquid boils vigorously in the bulb a okay so this uh, procedure expels all the air uh, from the isotenoscope ab the level of the liquid in the limb l2 L2 is the limb which is close to the bulb B. It stands higher than in the limb L1. Okay. Now what is uh, what we do? Uh, now we do. Uh, now we set the temperature of the thermostat. This is uh, thermostat to adjust it. Uh, to a desired value and then air is slowly admitted into the apparatus and uh, how it is done it is done by connecting the bottle d to uh, atmosphere until the liquid levels in both the limbs that is l1 and l2 become exactly equal so pressure in the limb l1 is the vapor pressure whereas the pressure in the limb l2 is equal to the pressure in the rest of the apparatus and it is equal also equal to the atmospheric pressure minus the height of the mercury column in the tube c okay so this difference that is the difference between the atmospheric pressure minus the height of the mercury column uh, in the tube c it gives the difference uh, it, it gives the vapor pressure of the liquid at the temperature of the thermostat Till now, in the static method, we are measuring the vapor pressure of a liquid by varying the external pressure at a certain temperature. But in the dynamic method, the external pressure is kept constant and the temperature of the liquid is raised till it starts boiling. During the recording of the temperature, the thermostat should be placed in the vapor phase but not in the liquid phase. In the, uh, uh, during the procedure, by fixing the external pressure over the liquid at different values, the boiling point of the liquid can be determined at each external pressure. So let us uh, assume that the boiling points be T1, T2, T3, etc. at external pressures P1, P2, P3, etc. Then obviously we say that the pressures P1, P2, P3, etc. are the vapor pressure at the temperatures T1, T2, T3 respectively. So for any particular liquid, if we simply plot the vapor pressure against the corresponding temperature, the vapor pressure at any temperature can be found. The rest of the liquid state unit will be covered in my upcoming video tutorial classes. Thank you.